Most ultrasound probes emit an almost two-dimensional fan-like beam. You'll usually find a marker or indicator on one edge of the probe, and we refer to this edge of the probe as its indicator edge. The indicator might be a protrusion, like on this probe, or a line, or a colored light. The opposite edge of the probe is called the non-indicator edge. The edge of the ultrasound beam on the indicator edge is the beam's leading edge, and the edge of the ultrasound beam on the non-indicator edge is the beam's receding edge. When we image anatomy with an ultrasound probe, by convention, vendors almost always display the ultrasound image with an indicator mark on the upper left edge of the image field on screen. The indicator mark may look a little different from vendor to vendor. On this GE unit, the indicator mark is the text Logic E10, while on this Siemens unit, it's a stylized logo, while on this other GE unit, it's a circle with a P inside of it. By convention, we hold a probe so that the probe's indicator edge is in the same orientation as the indicator mark on the displayed image, so that the displayed image always is in the same orientation as the patient's anatomy in real life. Let's say you were to flip the probe 180 degrees so that the probe's indicator edge faces the other direction. While the image displayed on screen would also flip, the indicator mark on the displayed image remains in the same spot since indicator marks are static graphics that are usually not intelligent about the way you're holding the probe. If someone were to view your ultrasound image later in the day and hadn't been in the room watching how you had held the probe, they might have no way of knowing that you had held the ultrasound probe backwards. If they assumed you held the probe the other way, they could make right versus left errors. Therefore, it's a universal convention when ultrasounding patients that the indicator edge always points towards the patient's right side for transverse images and that the indicator edge always points towards the patient's head for sagittal images. Probe movements. There are six degrees of freedom when flying an airplane. Your airplane can translate in three axes, forward and back, left and right, up and down. Your aircraft can also pivot along three axes. You can roll and cause the wingtips to go up and down. You can pitch and cause the nose of the aircraft to go up and down. And you can yaw and make the nose of the plane point right or left. Just like with an aircraft, there are six degrees of freedom when moving an ultrasound probe. You can translate the probe in three axes. These correlate to forward and back is called sweeping. The correlate to left to right is called sliding and the correlate to up-down is called compression. You can pivot the probe in three axes too. The correlate to roll is called rocking. The correlate to pitch is called fanning. And the correlate to yaw is called rotation. Now, let's show you this visually. With translation, the head of the probe will move from one place on the patient's skin to another. You can move in the x-axis or y-axis parallel to the patient's skin surface, and you can move in the z-axis perpendicular to the patient's skin surface. When translating the probe, the angle of the probe relative to the skin is usually perpendicular and fixed throughout the motion. The translation motion is usually performed in a slow and steady way. Here's an example of what sweeping with a probe looks like as the probe head translates along the x-axis while its angle relative to the skin surface remains perpendicular and fixed. Motion along the long axis of the probe across the body is called sliding. Notice that the angle of the probe relative to the skin surface remains perpendicular and fixed. Pressure on the probe into the patient's body is called compression. Again, the angle of the probe relative to the skin surface remains perpendicular and fixed. With pivoting motions, the head of the probe remains in contact with the same point on the patient's skin surface, but the probe orientation pivots so that the ultrasound beam is fired into the patient at different angles. Pivoting in the long axis of the probe about a fixed point is called rocking. Pivoting in the short axis of the probe 
about a fixed point is called fanning. And pivoting the probe along the axis of the transducer cable, either clockwise or counterclockwise, is called rotation. When we're first learning how to use an ultrasound probe, we tend to perform these individual types of ultrasound motions independently, one at a time, to keep things predictable and under control. As you become more adept at scanning, you'll feel increasingly comfortable with performing more complex motions, translating and rotating the probe simultaneously or along more than one axis at a time. Each of the six ultrasound probe motions can help accomplish different goals when you're scanning a patient. Sweeping is generally used for blind searches. The best analogy is on CT when we're scrolling up and down through a stack of axial CT images to look for something in the CT volume. If we, if we find something during our sweep, we'll usually need to use other probe motions to investigate that finding. Sliding is generally used when we want to bring a target that is visible near or just past the leading or receding edge of our image into the center of the image. Let's say we're scanning some anatomy and the object of interest is that triangle. By sliding the probe, we can bring the triangle from the leading edge of the image to the center of the image. Compression is a useful maneuver that helps get us better ultrasound images and can sometimes directly help us diagnose things like DVTs and acute cholecystitis. Image quality can suffer when we're not holding an ultrasound probe firmly against the skin, since some of the ultrasound waves that help create our image don't make it into the patient's body. Sometimes there might be tiny gas bubbles in the ultrasound gel, which can cause shadowing artifacts that can also make it hard to see. By applying compression, we can help fix these sort of problems by providing better acoustic coupling between the probe head and the, and the patient's body, and also pushing gas bubbles in the gel away. Bow gas can obscure anatomy, and compression can often displace bow gas, allowing us to see things better. Sometimes compression is part of the diagnostic process itself, like when we're checking to see if a vein squashes normally during a DVT search, or if there's a DVT that prevents this form of squashing of the vein closed. Compression also helps us diagnose acute cholecystitis when we're checking for a sonographic Murphy sign. Rocking is a motion we use when we prefer to slide to see something near or just past the leading or receding edge of an image, but we either can't slide or we don't want to slide. Let's say we need to get a better look at the square that's just past the leading edge of our image, but there also happens to be a rib nearby that was immediately above it. If we were to translate our probe, we'd see nothing because our target would fall behind the acoustic shadow of the rib. If we pivoted the probe, we'd have an opportunity to see the square target behind the rib. Rocking is also helpful for measuring objects. Distance measurements on ultrasound tend to be more inaccurate when different parts of the object are at different distances from the probe head. By pivoting the probe, we can bring the object we're measuring into a, an alignment that's parallel to our probe head and allow us to get a more accurate distance measurement. Fanning, like rocking, is a motion we use when we'd prefer to sweep to see something, but we either can't or don't want to sweep. Or when you want to see something in a true orthogonal short axis rather than an oblique one. Rotation is also a motion we use to see something in a true orthogonal long axis or true short axis rather than an oblique one. Now, let's bring everything we discussed together into a basic strategy you can use when you need to perform an ultrasound. An overarching principle will be to use larger motions with our probe while we're getting a lay of the land, and then use finer motions once we've found our target. Start with large sweeps over the region of interest, like you were mowing a lawn. While you're doing this, pay attention to what spots provide the best or worst acoustic windows for viewing. Just like playing Minesweeper, you'll eventually find your target. If your target is near the leading or receding edge of your image when you find it, slide your probe to bring the target to the center of the image. If sliding isn't an option, 
try rocking the probe to get a more optimal view of your target. At this point, I like to use a few small fan motions to make sure I'm not cutting through the target obliquely and confirm that I'm indeed seeing a true transverse plane through the target. Once I'm happy with where I've translated my probe and how I've pivoted it to see the target, I'll do fine sweeps to study what's going on and to make my diagnosis. It's also a good idea to do a 90 degree rotation to get a fine orthogonal perspective of your target too. Now go and scan.